Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at theCUBE Research. And today, as usual, I'm joined by my co-host, fellow analyst, brilliant engineer, wonderful human being, Joe Peterson. Joe, welcome. Always nice to see you. Thank you for the glowing intro. <laughs> And today we are joined by Jason Thomas. Jason is the CIO of a law firm by the name of Cole Scott Kassane, and they happen to be one of the AM Law 200 firms and Florida's largest law firm. And we are going to have a conversation today about how to balance productivity gains and, and how to think about what you need to think about when you're getting ready to embrace AI for law firms. Jason, welcome. It's glad to, it's great to have you. Thanks, Shirley. Thanks, Joe. Good to be here. Absolutely. So, okay, before we dive into our conversation, I want to set the table a little bit. And what we're going to talk about specifically today with Jason is Microsoft Copilot for Microsoft 365. Um, it's an enterprise grade Gen AI assistant, part of the Microsoft application suite. And of course, it's designed to uh, enhance user productivity. Um, the AI assistant works in conjunction with Microsoft Teams, Outlook, SharePoint, all the things. And um, and I will say it's important to note as, you know, we talk about AI powered solutions, um, there is a per user subscription for Copilot in addition to a Microsoft enterprise license. So if you're inspired by this conversation to check it out, know that there are some costs involved. So Jason, um, I want to start with what I is the favorite thing about these conversations for me. I always ask our guests to share a little bit about their career backstory. We all sometimes take interesting paths to um, the place where we end up at this particular moment in time. And sometimes there's some surprising things that we've done over the course of our career. So Joe and I always learn something new about our guests when I ask this question. So how about you share with us a little bit about your career journey? Yeah, uh, I made a lot of quote unquote moves through college. I st I I've been probably been through three different colleges and programs because I couldn't quite find a good fit for what I thought that I wanted to do. And 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 back then there was no program for what I wanted to do. So I, you know I started with uh, some. I think I started with pre med and then went to computer engineering, then the computer science, and then uh, I end up with a degree in uh, business administration. So we all take our different paths, I guess. And I end up with a, uh, I applied for a job off of Craigslist um, back in the day and actually got the job. I believe it or not. Can you imagine getting the job of Craigslist? Well, I mean, uh, back in the day, that's not such an unusual thing. Yeah, that was the thing. Uh, now, 10 years into that job, I found out later on that the only reason why I was hired because my English was better than the person uh, they were interviewing um, for the job. So I was like, all right, well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, I will share that in the the journey. You know, and and I have I have eighteen year old high school seniors who are getting ready to go to college, and this is not my first rodeo. They have two much older sisters, but one of the conversations I have with them is like, don't stress yourself out too much about trying to figure out what you want to be today, because most of us reinvent ourselves, right? Sometimes yeah. we reinvent ourselves throughout our college years. Sometimes it's after that. When I was in college, um, I would have bet any amount of money that I was going to end up being an attorney. I had worked as a paralegal for about 10 years. I had an amazing mentor who owned a law firm uh, who encouraged me. And um, I, I went to college. I resisted being a poli sci major because I really, I knew enough about life to know that things sometimes don't work out. And I really couldn't see what I would do with that. But I ended up majoring in communications, which is a great major for lawyers and, uh, or, you know, hopeful potential lawyers. And by the time I graduated, it just, I realized, well, I actually got a job with a small law firm, a big law firm rather, tested it out and it wasn't what I wanted to do. And somehow I made a U-turn into, into advertising and marketing. So we all, kind of <laughs> kind of go our own ways here and you never know what what the next turn is going to be do you 
Yeah. So you've been the CIO of, of Cole, Scott and Kassane for the better part of the last decade. And it's safe to say you've seen a few things. Um, Joe and I both love the fact that in your LinkedIn headline, you say we've been doing AI before that was a thing. Um, can you share with us a little bit as we launch into this show, a, a, a little bit about your firm's journey on the AI train? Sure. So um, I say that because um, obviously what everyone considers AI now, I think it's generative AI, but from the um, from from um, the back end for administrative functions, we've been using that for years in terms of um, automating cash receipts and um, a lot of billing slash processes. And now in the last couple of years, has it even been two years? I guess it's been a year and a half where Genova has really taken off. And now that's what everyone considers AI, just what you see in chat GPT, but that's not all of AI. <laughs> right. So, it's been around yeah. as part of business process automation yeah. for a very long time. A very yeah. long time. And what we're seeing now commercially and kind of, um, uh, I, I'll call it user facing is very different from what um, everyone thinks the definition of AI is. Yep. Yeah. That's a true story. Um, so when you think about Copilot, Jason, and how it empowers lawyers and their teams, um, what is your thinking on the business value that law firms like yours could realize um, beyond the, some of the automation that you just talked about with mundane tasks? Uh, something as simple as uh, with Copilot, with, we're testing internally, um, even just simple responses to emails where um, we kind of have to think about what we want to say, whereas we can, uh, you know, trigger or prompt the ad to say, this is what I want to say, but I'm not exactly sure the best way to say it. Yes. They help me out there. And, and very simple things on that end to uh, full blown. Now we don't, uh, on our side, I wouldn't say we use a ton of Excel or PowerPoint AI, but for the lawyers at least, but there's, this, there's a lot of flexibility and option there to just present something graphically. So talking about is one thing showing data and showing information is another thing so i think it, it offers a lot for flexibility and options for lawyers to say hey maybe i should talk about it let me let me present it in a different way that makes sense to the audience so um that's that's where i see it now if you want my hot take right now do you want the hottest hot take yes I, <laughs> I think copilot is going to crush most of what's out there in the legal AI space. That's an opinion. That's just, just my take because of how nice. fast. I think nice. it's just because every day that I use Copilot or every other day I log in, I was like, huh, this is new. This is different. This is something that to do. And they don't even announce it anymore. They're moving mm -hmm. so fast. I think I, I just think Microsoft has the money and the R and D to yeah. to build it out so quickly that yeah look I'm happy for all these startups and, you know, people in, in the AI startup space and, and all that and getting investments to do whatever, but I don't think they can match the speed. Well, I think there's what? another part. I think there's another part of this equation, Jason, and it's simply that, you know, well, first of all, Microsoft was very quick to the Gen AI race, mm -hmm. right? Um, and um, there's no doubting that. Um, the other thing I will say that, I just got back from Enterprise Connect in Orlando, big industry. I event. sent a couple of my folks to that last week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But the thing about it is, I want to make sure that everybody knows we're talking about Microsoft Copilot because every vendor on the planet now has named something Copilot, Copilot, Copilot. Mm -hmm. And so it can be very confusing. Um, that was one of the things I encountered at Enterprise Connect, lots of co-pilots. But yeah, um, that's a really good point that there's lots of co-pilots. But back to what Jason was saying, Jason, don't don't you think that this is a rich environment for an ecosystem to develop? It is. But who's going to do it the fastest? First okay, to market, is, is the, I think the first to market is first to win. Yeah, right. Yes. I, I think in this space, particularly. 
Well, yeah. and I think the other thing too, though, that where Microsoft has such an advantage is, and this happened really before the the Gen AI wave, but Microsoft 365 is, and, and all of the Microsoft products are so embedded across enterprises, right? Yeah. So I think that it, the company had a competitive advantage to begin with. You yeah. know, it's kind of like when we talk about when we talk about collaboration platforms and we talk we compare Microsoft Teams and Google Meet and Cisco Webex. I mean, the reality of it is the and and I will say that plenty of Microsoft Teams users don't love the Teams interface, but the reality can't of it is it's yeah, it, can't stand it. it. Yeah, it's but it's enterprise wide, so you're going to yep. use it. So I do think that that plays a role here. You know, yeah, I mean, uh, in general, like Slack versus Teams, I wish I could go back to Slack, but at this point, we know, I mean, we are right. we have to move forward, and we've adopted Teams, and I don't love the interface, but this is where it's going, and we'll hope and pray that it gets better from a UI, UX perspective, and it will. It's yeah. just going to take some time. But Jason, right. like my young engineers all send me messages on Teams, and I'm like, would you please send me an email I'm old and I'm old school <laughs> and I need, I need to track the thing. I need to track it and I can't track it in teams. They make me crazy. The youngins with their, with their, they just say, yeah. So, I think it's also maybe how your brain works too. And, and I will say that some of us use our email as a filing cabinet and, yeah. and, and I've used all of these, I have Zoom and WebEx okay. and Teams and everything else. And of course, all of these vendors want you to put every bit of the work that you do and the communications that you have and documents that you share everything into their platforms. And sometimes yeah. that, I mean, that's certainly beneficial for them, right? Because they want you to be all in. Um, sometimes searchability and findability and all that kind of thing can be challenging. So I don't think it's so much that you're old because you're not, and I'm older than you are, so shut it. Um, but I think it is how our brains are wired sometimes and what works best for some doesn't always work best for others. But do you think well, it's generational too? Perhaps. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I think it's an interface that, you know, they're just more accustomed to. So Again, you can file the conversation yeah. and set a reminder if you want, right? It's just a different way of doing it. So it's not like rather than dragging and dropping into a folder of immediate attention or whatever you want to call it, you mm -hmm. can uh, you can find stuff in Teams. It's just uh, it's different. It's, it's just, just different. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. Different okay, fair enough. All right. All right, so I'm going to quit talking about collaboration platforms, and we're going to keep talking about security. So about four weeks ago, we noticed that Clifford Chance, global law firm, 34 offices across 23 countries and a paltry 3,600 attorneys, rolled out Microsoft 365 and Viva Suite at scale across its entire workforce. So this is probably the biggest and the first um, of international law firms to integrate Copilot. In a conversation discussing this rollout, their CTO, a guy by the name of Clifford Chance, um, oh no, I'm sorry, a guy by the name of Paul Greenwood, cited the availability of live transcripts via Teams Premium as being important, as well as co-pilot summaries. Now, for any of us, you know, using any of these platforms right now, those the summaries and the transcripts are incredibly valuable. Um, absolutely can't argue there. He also stated that AI helps everyone stay on track with tasks and commitments that were made. And um, so our question here is what, how much of an impact do you think that Microsoft Copilot will have, especially in large law firms? I mean, I feel like you already answered this. <laughs> In terms so, of, it's amazing, but go ahead. So, so listen, Clifford Chance, right? A lot of respect to them as a, as as a as a uh, leader. And my my thing um, is, are we trying? Uh, I'm not trying to dog them or whatever. Are we trying to make a splash? Or are we actually trying to do something? One, do you have appropriate policies in place? Two, did we train folks on Copilot, or are we just say, here's your license and here you go? <laughs> I didn't say they did. They like these are things we have to consider. Like everyone wants the newest stuff and the latest stuff and the hottest stuff. Um, and AI is obviously very hot right now. Um, so hot right now that they say it in Zoolander. Um, you, you've seen that meme, I'm sure. With um, <laughs> um, so the question is, 
if you, if you don't have a really good um, change management slash training slash policy in place, I've seen so much in the AI space where, you know, there was a huge, huge, huge excitement and adoption, and it was up here. And then over the course of time, it dropped. <laughs> so, so what are we doing to make sure that people understand what is it that we're doing? Why are we doing it? What is it being really used for as opposed to we're just... Um, we're excited about this technology. There's, there's just so much to it. There's, there's yeah. almost too much to it where folks can get overwhelmed and just go back to the way they were doing things just because, you know what, this is too much for you to just ingest right now. Well, it is it is learning something new. It is, it is as you said, change management. Tell us a little bit about, you know, in the conversations that you have with your peers within the legal field, what do you see on the adoption front so far? Do you see that it's something that people are diving in with both feet or is it something that people are taking a more measured approach? What do you see in the industry? I think everybody wants AI, but they don't really know what that means. Really? It's, it's a buzzword and it's something that whether it's the colleagues are using, the kids are using, whatever it is that they're doing, they want it to, but then how is it applied to what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis? And that's our job on the um, technology side and adoption side to help them explain, explain to them, say, hey, this is really, this is what it's going to do for you from a day-to-day -day basis, as opposed to, yeah, you go home at night, sure, you can help a kid with your homework and all this other kind of stuff. But, you know, let's talk about, you know, everyone's talking about it, but let's talk about what it's going to help. How is it going to help you um, on the business side and help you generate business, generate revenue, all that. And that's, that's our job to help them figure that out. So do you think that's where people are right now, having these internal conversations? How is it going to help us? How will it help our teams? How are we going to get our arms around? Is that kind of where we are in the early stages of conversations, generally speaking? Yeah, I think that's one of the conversations. And the second conversation is I think clients are, they're not necessarily demanding right now, but they're curious and wondering what we're doing and they'd like to see what we're doing. Whereas before years ago, when, um, the you know, term cloud was a thing, everybody was anti-cloud. No, we're not putting anything in cloud. We're not doing that. Whatever. Whereas something has changed for sure. Uh, when it came to AI, folks aren't asking if you use if, folks aren't saying, Hey, or clients aren't saying, hey, if you use it, we don't want to work with you. It's more, well, how are you using it? Just out of curiosity and what are you doing? We'd like to know more. The attitude and just the whole perception of it has changed. Yeah, that makes you, sense. Yeah, it does make sense. And you, you know, you brought up a couple really good points, or at least that I keyed into, Jason. One was about education, right? And the other one was about productivity that helps you make money quicker, faster, right? So um, when we think about Copilot and we think about e-discovery, um, how is it that people are, or lawyers and their teams using Copilot for e-discovery? Um, and then how are they, you know, how are CIOs like yourself educating them on it? and and is there really a gain in terms of productivity from using the tool? So with our current e-discovery platforms or everything that's out there right now, we have to, or, or our lawyers have to manually upload the data, mm -hmm. right? Now, everything's being ingested and automatically uploaded, mm -hmm. which is great, except the question becomes, do you want everything to be discoverable <laughs> number one right. right this is a great concept until we say wait a minute we have we have guardrails we have policies place when it comes to emails you know whether it's hey we only keep we have a retention policy of x number of days or months and now we have to apply these same policies to AI. we can't just just outright just gather all the data this is great we have all this data we can you know it's discoverable uh i don't think we want that necessarily but we do but we have to put those same policies got rules in place we can't just let everybody out you know out of the gate and say hey here it is 
Everything's for it. there for you. Yeah, go <laughs> for it. Yeah. Well, how did you know where I was driving the bus? That's exactly where I was driving the bus, right? Um, permissions and confidentiality and data labeling. Yeah. So what? How are you doing all that? Okay, we're in the early stages, so I'll leave that to corporate chance to figure out, and then let us, you know, give us give us the case studies, and you know, here's right. what we did right, here's what we did wrong. But no, but seriously, uh, yeah, uh, they've probably done that for months, and so yeah, uh, yeah, we just don't want want to just let this stuff loose, no matter how badly anyone wants it, because um, compliance, unfortunately. Uh, compliance and security and all that, that's, that's in the back of the lawyers' minds, right? It's not that they don't want it. It's just not their job. Right. So it's on us um, from the IT security, GRC side to say, hey, the, these are kind of the guardrails we put into place and say, hey, just because uh, we gathered all this data, you know, remember, you only have X number of days to save and file emails after that. You know, this is our retention policy. This isn't like freedom inside the AI space. Like, just put everything out there for anyone to find at any time. Right, right. And you're always worried about exfiltration. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's worried about exfiltration, right? Um, and that's really kind of a good uh, a good segue into my next question is that, you know, as we see Microsoft Copilot starting to gain adoption in the legal field, and, you know, we've been talking about e-discovery, you know, do you think there's going to be, I want to talk about data a little bit and data management. So do you think there'll be a shift away from custodian-centric data, this is my data that I've created, here's my folder, whatever, whatever, to collaborative data, here's a file that we can all work on together, or or content content centric data. Oh, um, yeah, Shelly, I think we've already seen that on our I hate to call it legacy e-discovery, but that's what it's gonna become become, right? With, with our current platforms is okay, I have this, I have this, and then you know, I think there's already questions about and and uh desire for collaboration. Well, let's just I'm so sure it goes where I've moved back and forth. I think it's just this is just simply going to accelerate mm -hmm. that that process because they because before you can kind of say oh I don't know if I could do that everybody knows you can do that here you know there's there's no there's it's so easy now it well in fact it's so easy that it's you can make a mistake and put everything out there so I think it's harder now to secure it as opposed to not yeah. Secure. Because uh, by default, I think the e-discovery platforms right now have become very pessimistic in their approach. So everything is locked down. Whereas Copilot, I think we're still, well, you know, well, you know, they're trying to put something stuff out there so fast that I don't know if security is really number one. Okay, that makes me a little twitchy. <laughs> well, the reason why I see that is because now. Not to pick on Microsoft, but you know that now, now they're kind of upselling more security platforms and solutions on top of their current stuff. That, in my opinion, probably should have there should have been more thought put into how are we going to secure this from the ground up, as opposed to well, everybody wants this and this is what every, what the demand is, and oh yeah, we didn't think of that so. Let's put something on top of this and we'll sell you more. Yeah. And so you can pay for the enterprise instance and then yep. you can pay for the co-pilot instance and then yep. you can pay for the security. For more and security. Yeah. No, I, I do have to say that I'm not a fan of that. I mean, I really, I'm looking for security to be foundational into anything that I'm using across the board. And I want people to be thinking about security as they're building the damn thing. So, um, yeah. You know, but, Shelley, there's, there's, and it still goes on. There's a... You ever notice on the free platforms, you don't get SSO or MFA? Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. Nope. Nope. Yeah, well, when it's free, you're the product, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, listen, upsell me on your other features, but security is not a feature. Yeah. yeah. It's an expectation. I mean, right. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, we've all, even consumers, we're all consumers, right? 
And even consumers without IT backgrounds have gotten smarter and are starting to expect that, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a sweeping generalization. <laughs> uh, I'm a I am just saying, girl. as three people who focus a lot in the realm of cybersecurity, I, you know, far too many people are paying zero attention to the dangers that they're navigating. But I mean, and I, love your, I love your sunny outlook, Joe. <laughs> I mean, if, if I'm buying a car right now, um, I shouldn't have to pay more for the key that locks the door when I walk off. I have to remember no. to lock the door. I mean, come on. Yeah, I'm so, with you. Come on. I, I mean, if you want to charge you for heated seats, like allegedly BMW is doing, it's for a subscription fee. That's fine. I mean, I can get over. I can get over that. I think I can get over. That. And by the way, I would pay for that subscription. Oh, sorry. Hashtag hot cross buns. Right. Yeah, all day long. Right. That, is, that is table stakes for a free driving experience today. One of the biggest things when I brought my well, interesting life. When I bought my deal, I was like, can I get BMW? When I, I was like, can I get autos, like, you know, remote start? They're like, no. I'm like, I'll pay more for the, you know, remote start. They're like, we can't do it. And if you go third party, it voids your warranty. I'm like, oh, no, you yeah. off my car in the winter. They're yeah. like, nope. Now, it could be a different thing now. This is 2018. Yeah. Uh, but maybe there's a different thing. But, you know, there's certain things that I understand that I should or have to pay for for luxuries. Yeah. But again, security is not a luxury. It is. Opinion. It's foundational. It's expected. Yeah. And and even if your end user and your customers don't expect it, I, you know, I feel like the industry should expect it and require it. You know, I mean, it's just yeah. don't count on your consumers to know what's important. No way. We know what's important when we're building this stuff. So build it from a foundation of security and go from there. And it's really not, you know, it's not rocket science. Good. So we were talking earlier about ecosystem and I'm starting to see things labeled works with Copilot already. I've seen them labeled that way. So my understanding is that Copilot will scan the legal software that it's coupled with to automatically read various types of documents, handwritten items, PDFs, find all the deadlines or appointments that are included. Question to you is, do you anticipate a vendor collaboration explosion with Copilot in the legal field? And if yes, is there really going to be value to it? Do I anticipate a, a vendor uh, participation yes they have no choice number two is there value for them for a little while but like i said at the beginning of this conversation unless there's a very niche very specific place in legal for for these yeah platforms i think copilot is going to really crush a lot of them. Uh, a lot if of they don't play if they don't yeah, just I, jump on the flight. I don't wish for that. Don't get me wrong. But I, I think that, that they're just, they've got the money, the R&D, the name, the, the coverage in terms of, they, they have everybody. They have everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and again, that usage adoption throughout the enterprise of Microsoft products is, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we're all griping about teams, but <laughs> this yeah, is great. Yeah, 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 thing. You know, I was thinking, you know, I think it's saying you know, when I'm looking at AI platforms now, and this is probably now becoming more um, legacy type licensing, we'll say, hey, so how much for your platform? It's, oh, we we charge by number of employees or by number of attorneys. Yeah. I don't have to do that with Copilot. Right. I want to give it to 100 attorneys or 100 employees, no problem. Microsoft doesn't, you know, say, oh, I'm sorry, you have, you know, 1,500 employees, you got to have to license for everybody. I was like, well, how many of these 1500 people you think is going to use it i know they're not yeah and exactly. so they're they're kind of putting themselves in a bad spot just from that licensing model alone yeah plus it's up front right you can't go monthly. monthly you nope. can't go monthly it's up front nope. okay That's i love yeah, your I'm not, I'm not doing that deal I'm not. I am just not doing that deal because you know what? Fine. 
then I'll keep giving Copilot to people until it gets better and better and better. And then I'm not going to, I'm not going to use your platform. Then. Unless there's something really compelling. I think as Copilot is, uh, tweaked and whatever, and the API, if there's an API, I think there is, I, I'm not sure, uh, what the deal is, but as, as we can continue to tune it, then what do I need other platforms for? Yeah. You're going to have to give me something to buy into. Otherwise, I'm not paying for 1,500 employees. Yeah. There's no value there. I have to justify that expense and that, you know, investment. We'll, we'll call it investment. But, you know, if, if I got 30% adoption, then where happened to the other 70%? Well, it was a licensing fee, so I had to do it. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's more than a little expensive. Yeah. So, Jason, as we wrap the show, I want to circle back and just ask you for, you know, we are blazing new trails here. Um, and I know that it's a big job to be trying to get arms around things like, you know, AI throughout the enterprise and the costs associated with that and the training, and all that sort of thing. And of course, the security risks. Um, but what is your best advice for someone in the legal field who may be watching or listening, who's thinking about this, but hasn't yet gone down this path? What, what is your best advice to them? Where do we start? What do we worry about? So here, he, uh, I saw an interview with Mark Cuban um, a few months ago on uh, CNBC or something. And basically, uh, I'll put it like that. What he said is either you're going to get on the AI train or you're not. And the ones that do are going to be successful. The ones who don't will not be successful. I'm not saying... Uh, Mark Cuban is the god of, you know, technology and whatever. But I mean, I mean, he's got a little bit under his belt. He's, he's made a few billion, I think. And I mean, he understands it. And, and that's my that's my take to my college stuff. You, you have to do it. You, you adapt or die. Yeah. And I think AI is is in such high demand. And, and there's so much interest that you have no choice but to. Otherwise, I think you're going to get left behind in the dust. And somebody else will... Um, uh, take over. So I agree with you. Um, but my question is, with like, so I'm thinking about this, and I'm a CIO, I'm a CTO, I'm a CISO, one of these things. Um, the I think that first of all, you need to have a seat at the table as we're talking about these things. Obviously, I mean, but this is like a senior leadership board level conversation. How are we going to do this? How are we going to spur adoption? How are we going to provide ongoing training? What's our AI strategy? You know, all of those, what are our guardrails? How are we dealing with compliance? How, you know, it, it, our legal team needs to be a part of this conversation. You know, all those things. I think sometimes it can be sort of overwhelming to think about all of those things, but is you the best step? Great. You know what's, what's great? There's so much education out there right now and paid even. And look, uh, Harvard has one, MIT one has one, Cornell has one, Wharton has one. They all have AI in business. It's just not a technical course. It's, you know, yeah. a very business-oriented strategic course. If you know nothing right now, you don't know where to go, I'm taking a course. Yeah. And you most of them are that. free, by the way. Yeah. Many of them are free. Many of them are free. And if you want to go really out there, I mean, they might be three thousand uh, dollars for a six or seven week course i think your firm would be more than happy if you set the show interest in issues say hey this i think where the firm needs to go or the company needs to go um i just need a little more information you know what what the experts are saying or you know what's out there to kind of help figure out what direction we should go i don't can't see a good good leadership team that's going to say no to that yeah that's pennies so, so best advice is to dig in, to uh, to accept the fact that this is the path forward, even though it can be a little scary. Um, take every opportunity that you can to learn more, and and you know I think that this is also an important part. I think that we are now in the time where continuous learning is a business imperative. Mm -hmm. It's a career imperative. It's an individual imperative. You know what I'm saying? Like we all have to kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm that 
same geek that I was in, you know, sixth grade, loving reading every book I could get my hands on or whatever. But, you know, my point is, and this is a bit of a career advice that I give my 18 year olds is that, you know, we are as humans many times not um, crazy about change, but I think learning to embrace change and really understanding that all of us, I don't care how, what age we are or where we are in our career roles or positions or anything else, it's that, that continuous learning that is going to be, I think, the important for all of us. You know, Shelly, it's funny, and Joe, uh, how much we complain about our end users, about how they're so... Um, can slash not open to change but we can't be those same people and yet we are those same people who are not <laughs> always open to change <laughs> that's funny how that works mm -hmm. yeah well I, I will say i'm kind of I, i've always been an outlier on that front i love change i operate well in a state of chaos and sometimes you just get what you get from a wiring standpoint. So this, yep. this whole, these, these times, even going back for the last 10 or 20 years, that, that has served me well. Um, but I do, I do agree that this is not, this is not a fad. This is not something that you can kind of ignore. You know, we've, I, I've talked about this before, you know, I remember, I remember we're all old enough to have lived through, you know, the, the rise of the web and the internet and how that changed the way we, we interact and the way we do business and everything. And I'll never forget years and years ago when I was in my late twenties, you know, one of my bosses proudly saying, I don't use email. That's stupid. I'm never going to use email to communicate, you know? And I remember thinking, yeah, we, we, you're not going to go far with that. <laughs> I, don't care that you're this, I don't care that you're the CEO because what it says is that you don't really understand the transformation that's happening right now. And you're not going to be a part of it. Yeah. So, well, Jason Thomas, CIO of Cole, Scott, and Kassane, uh, Florida's largest law firm. Amazing conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with Joe Peterson and I today. It has been truly a pleasure. And you know what? We're going to circle back with you and we're going to, I know you're going to be paying attention to what's going on at Clifford Chance. And yep. so we're going to come back to this conversation and, you know, maybe what we'll talk about is the lessons that Clifford Chance learned that we don't want to repeat the mistakes along the way that we don't want to repeat. How about sure. That? Yeah. You know, I love trying to, I, I, I respect the Miley for this yeah. is a big, big, big move. And I love it. It is. It's a big man. Of course, we wish them all the success. And the only way yes. that you learn what works and what doesn't work is sometimes to just dive right on in. So yep. with that, again, thank you so much for joining us. You both have been awesome. And again, Jason, we're going to we're going to be uh, having you on the show again and, and doing another catch up here in, I don't know, four or six months and see what's changed. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks, to our view thanks to our viewing and listening audience. Be sure and hit that subscribe button and we'll see you back here next week.